This is Dr. Robert C. Newman in his short course on the Miraculous and the Miracles of Jesus, Lecture 7, Miracles of Jesus Over the Spiritual Realm. Okay, uh, we're continuing our course, The Miraculous and the Miracles of Jesus. Uh, we've looked at uh, four lectures on the miraculous. And uh, this is now the third lecture on the miracles of Jesus. We looked at the, uh, Jesus' miracles over the uh, natural realm and Jesus' miracles over the human realm. And now we look at Jesus' miracles over the spirit realm. <clears throat> As we're using this phrase in distinction from the human realm, previous talk, we here refer to spirit beings other than humans, in this case uh, what we call demonic beings. Among the more Secular inhabitants of our modern Western world, demons are typically relegated to the realm of fairy tales and superstition. This is not the view of the Bible, and we should not be tempted to follow the lead of theological liberals of the 19th and 20th centuries in attempting to edit these out of Christianity. We will not have space here to uh, discuss the biblical teaching on spirit beings, but I've done a bit of this in my PowerPoint talk, Angels and Demons, which is also on our IBRI website. Uh, www.ibri.org. I have also looked at the possibility of detecting the action of such beings in a more or less scientific way, we might say, in another talk called Evidence of Angels, question mark, also on that site. <clears throat> Let's look first of all at the Gadarene demoniacs found in Matthew 8, Mark 5, and Luke 8. <clears throat> We're going to look at the Matthew passage, which mentions the, the two demoniacs. When he, Jesus, arrived at the other side, other side of the Sea of Galilee, in the region of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men coming from the tombs met him. They were so violent that no one could pass that way. What do you want with us, son of God, they shouted. Have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? Some distance from them, a large herd of pigs was feeding. The demons begged Jesus, if you drive us out, send us into the herd of pigs. He said to them, go. So they came out and went to the pigs, and the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and died in the water. Those tending the pigs ran off, went into the town and reported all this, including what had happened to the demon-possessed men. Then the whole town went out to see, meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they pleaded with him to leave the region. Well, that's all we get in the Matthew account, longer in Mark uh, uh, <coughs> 5, uh, 1 through 20, etc., Historicity of the events, occasion closely related to the miracle of the calming of the storm, which is immediately follows in all three synoptics. It's still early in Jesus' Galilean ministry. Jesus is met by the demoniacs as he and the disciples disembark. Several liberal explanations of this. This is Alfred Plummer's list. The whole story is a myth. Or, the healing is historical, the pigs are not. Or, the demoniacs frighten the pigs who stampeded down the hill. <clears throat> the drowning of the pigs is an accident occurring about the same time. Uh, or the demoniacs are merely insane. Jesus humors them with regard to the pigs, but the story was taken as historical. That's a uh, rather extensive list of liberal explanations. Evidence of historicity, the details of the location, the other side, the tombs, the steep slope, even the variant names, Gadara, Gerasa, and Gergesa, which, by the way, uh, each occurs as a variant in each of the three uh, passages, uh, are of some interest. <clears throat> uh, we uh, talked about that a little bit, I think, in our, uh, our Synoptic Gospels course, it was, and uh, pointed out that uh, uh, Gadara and Gerasa are two of the uh, large uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, yeah, uh, Decapolis cities. And uh, the evidence now seems to suggest that they had, uh, the Decapolis cities uh, shared various uh, pieces, if you like, of the, uh, of the shore of the Sea of Galilee uh, for fishing rights and that sort of thing. And so uh, this may well have taken place on one of those. And Gergesa appears to be uh, the name of a little village uh, now called Kursi, uh, up on the kind of northern end, uh, actually a little east of the northern end of the Sea of Galilee. <coughs> Uh, the reaction of the people in sending Jesus away uh, makes good sense as well. If you're inventing a story, uh, you'd probably have them all excited about this. 
uh, but in fact uh, you've got uh, them concerned probably because they lost some pigs each one uh, but a person who can control the demons they are not about to start shouting and ask him to uh, uh, restore them uh, restore the pigs uh, since he might send the demons into them you know they don't know so uh, <clears throat> Uh, the reaction actually of the, uh, of the uh, pig herders running to get their story to the village first also is very striking in that direction. Reaction of the eyewitnesses, well the pigs are eyewitnesses and they stampede into the lake. <clears throat> the pig herders flee, as I said, perhaps to get to town with their side of the story first. Uh, the demoniac is now normal. The others come to see what has happened. And the eyewitnesses, the disciples, others, explain. The former demoniac, we see this in the parallel passage in Mark, wants to accompany Jesus. Old Testament background. Similar miracles? Not much. More in pagan, rabbinic, and intertestament literature. There's uh, just not much about demons in the Old Testament. Uh, there's uh, some uh, warrant from the Old Testament that demons lie behind much of pagan religion. And uh, we may have had some kind of demonic oppression in connection with uh, uh, the troubles that came upon Saul uh, after uh, uh, God had uh, replaced him, so to speak, with David, or had anointed David anyway. And uh, uh, probably there's warrant for believing that uh, the uh, Egyptian magicians and other such uh, have some kind of uh, demonic uh, influence as well. <clears throat> Os Guinness. <clears throat> has a rather interesting remark in one of his uh, books, I think it's Dust of Death, of uh, what he calls the campfire effect. And uh, that is that uh, uh, he's uh, dealing with the question of the rise of, uh, of interest in and examples of the demonic in Western culture since the 60s. And uh, Guinness said, uh, uh, it's something like what happens when you're out camping in a wilderness area where there are lots of wild game, that uh, uh, you build up a big fire and the animals stay away from it. And so you lay down and go to sleep, and then late at night the fire has burnt down, and the wild animals begin to uh, uh, look out of the bushes and think about the possibility of getting some fresh meat or something of that sort. <clears throat> and uh, Guinness says uh, that's basically what happens in the West uh, after the 60s, is that Christianity, so to speak, has burnt down in uh, many of these secularizing cultures, and now the uh, the occult is beginning to come out of the bushes and come back. So that might be kind of what is going on here with the, the uh, uh, larger amount of demonic activity that it appears that we see in rabbinic and intertestament literature and uh, particularly around the time of Jesus that uh, uh, <clears throat> the influence of paganism has had an effect on uh, uh, Jewish situation and even that these are flocking to uh, try and oppose what Jesus is going to do. We don't know how much they knew about that in advance, uh, but uh, Satan at least knows what's going on on earth, so surely would know something uh, when the uh, wise men show up and uh, such, and you can see from the activities of Herod that indeed he did. Uh, one thing you do see in the Old Testament of similar miracles are the control of animals by God, uh, Laban's sheep, uh, how they uh, bread, the plagues, the quail, Balaam's tonkey, the cows pulling the ark, the ravens feeding, the, uh, uh, feeding Elijah, uh, the bears uh, uh, beating on the, the uh, uh, punks who are after uh, Elisha, and the lions in Daniel's den. Huh? Control of animals by Satan, snake and garden, uh, and human animals, the Sabaeans and Chaldeans and Job, Demonic influence, uh, Saul, 1 Samuel 16, the false prophets in 1 Kings 22:22, 22, 22, uh, where a lying spirit is, uh, comes from uh, uh, God's counsel uh, to uh, uh, lure Ahab to his death in, uh, uh, across the, at Ramoth Gilead. <clears throat> There's little on Satan in the Old Testament. Uh, First Chronicles 21.1, he incited David to take a census. A uh, interesting uh, passage on causality. And this is not the top place to get into it. I do have a, uh, a PowerPoint on causation uh, that's also on our website. <laughs> I make little ads for our website in here. Uh, but uh, 
uh, it shows us that uh, in one sense, God did it, in one sense, Satan did it, obviously in one sense, David did it, and in another sense, David never went out and knocked in doors, okay? His uh, subordinates did it, and uh, uh, my take on that is uh, the story of uh, redemption in the human race is written by God, so everything that happens is in, at one level, God doing it, okay? But all sorts of actors in the story, and uh, uh, the vast majority, you know, all but uh, Jesus, in fact, are sinners after the fall of Adam and Eve, uh, are all doing things, and in one very important sense, they're making decisions on the basis of their uh, moral views and such, but in the other sense, they're doing what God has written the story. So I think we see that here as well. Job 1 and 2, Satan slanders Job. <clears throat> Psalm 109.6, uh, it says uh, one of the... Uh, uh, <clears throat> Psalms of uh, judgment, if you like, uh, let Satan stand at his right hand. Uh, uh, Satan is going to bring disaster upon Judas, in fact, uh, appears to be the fulfillment of that passage. <clears throat> Zechariah 3, 1 and 2, Satan is accusing uh, Jeshua, the high priest, uh, at his right hand in the presence of God, if you like. Possibly Genesis 6, 1 and 2, the sons of God, daughters of men. Uh, a couple of us have lean in the direction that we're looking at something supernatural there rather than merely uh, uh, intermarriage of the good guys with the bad guys or, uh, or uh, a, uh, <coughs> a pagan despot taking a harem or something of that sort, various other suggestions that have been made. The closest thing here is Zechariah 3 where God delivers Joshua, Jeshua the high priest from Satan, but it's not possession. Uh, significance, immediate effect, Two men are freed from Satan's power. Uh, the main one goes out to proclaim God's work. That, by the way, is how I understand the relationship between the Matthew passage and the Mark and Luke passage is that, uh, uh, <clears throat> that one of the demoniacs was the more demonized and the spokesman, etc., and the other one was pretty much in the background. We have a number of these one-two type things that occur again and again through the Gospels, and we don't have time machines, but uh, that's the way I would read them. <clears throat> The Gadarenes are out 2,000 pigs, so uh, they ask Jesus to leave. That's certainly part of the immediate effect. <clears throat> There's probably a deliverance judgment theme here. Place in salvation history, the apparently growing activity of the demonic in the intertestament period, as far as the Jews are concerned, uh, doesn't mean that it's necessarily growing in the pagan circles. It may just be that some of the pagan level is creeping into Jewish circles here. huh? Uh, perhaps due to mixing with Gentiles, uh, possibly due to the approaching conflict with the coming Christ. Direct confrontation with the powers of Satan we see here, and it's won decisively by Jesus. Does Jesus use the pigs to rid the area of demons? Possible. Or do the demons use the pigs to rid the area of Jesus? Can't tell for sure. But Jesus comes back. We see that in the later passage in uh, Mark, uh, Mark and uh, Matthew both believe. Mm. Jesus' power extends to the spiritual realm, not merely nature and disease. Symbolic elements. Given that uh, mm. Jesus' miracles often look forward to the end of the age, I suggest that here we see a foreshadowing of the defeat of Satan and the coming judgment. Mm. Note to remark to the demons in Matthew 8.29, what do you want with us, son of God, they shouted. Have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? Okay, so uh, a little hint of uh, uh, the eschaton isn't yet, and they uh, uh, seem to know that and are un unhappy that Jesus has shown up to throw them out. Huh? We turned in to another example of Jesus' power over the uh, spiritual realm, and that's the Syrophoenician's daughter in Matthew 15, Mark 7. We take this one from Mark, <clears throat> Mark 7, 24 and following. Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. He answered, entered the house, did not want anyone to know it, yet he could not keep his presence secret. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an evil spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, born in Syrian Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. First let the children eat all they want, he told her, for it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Yes, Lord, she replied, 
but even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he told her, for such a reply you may go, the demon has left your daughter. She went home and found her child lying on the bed, and the demon was gone. History of the event, occasion, uh, during the latter part of Jesus' ministry, his special time of working with his disciples. <clears throat> Matthew and Mark both put this, put this incident in the midst of two others, the Pharisaic opposition to the disciples, not washing their hands, and the feeding of the 4,000. Jesus has withdrawn to the northwest out of Galilee, presumably to avoid the crowds and his enemies, Mark 7, 24. Pagan woman recognizes him, seeks release of the demon-possessed daughter. Liberal explanations, psychosomatic. They don't believe in demons anyway. Okay? <clears throat> Evidence of historicity, well, it's consistently joined to these other incidents. The reference to the woman as a Canaanite in Matthew and a Greek or Syrophoenician in Mark are consistent. The place, the region of Tyre and Sidon, uh, region means not downtown, but the territory is controlled by them. The cryptic remarks of Jesus are in fact characteristic. He often says things that his disciples don't understand, that his opponents don't understand, etc. And he does something of that sort here. Similar miracles, besides the material on the demons that we had mentioned earlier, uh, things, miracles done for Gentiles or to Gentiles. There's the healing of Naaman and the uh, uh, rescue of uh, the Zarephath widow and her son from starvation, and then the, uh, the resurrection of the son. <clears throat> There's the miracles done to Pharaoh, okay, the uh, plagues and such, and the uh, death of the firstborn. There's the uh, miracles done to Nebuchadnezzar and giving him this uh, uh, coming to believe he's a uh, wild animal and living like it for several years. <clears throat> Other materials, well, the separation between Jew and Gentile is a rather important Old Testament background. And that, in a sense, comes up here in this whole thing about uh, uh, Jesus really has been sent to the Jews. And uh, here this uh, Gentile woman is trying to get him to do a miracle for her, but her response very impressive. Huh? We also see something, the oriental view of dogs, which is not high, but that they still did have some pet dogs now and then, and there's an implication of that, uh, particularly in the Matthew passage here. <clears throat> Immediate effect. Uh, remote exorcism of a demon without even a verbal command. Rather interesting, huh? So uh, here's your, uh, your Essene and uh, Josephus with this special ring that's got the herbs in it, and he comes over and draws it out, etc. A big uh, uh, spectacular display, and uh, we don't know how much was uh, uh, really occult and how much was uh, chicanery, uh, but here uh, uh, Jesus basically says uh, she, uh, the demon is gone, and uh, the woman walks home and finds out that's the case. Huh? The child is delivered. The faith of the woman in the face of obstacles. Uh, she doesn't give up easily, and uh, that's a biblical thing, uh, that uh, uh, we should pray for the right things, but if we're pretty sure they're the right things, uh, we should be persistent, and uh, the woman shows that here. And uh, we get the theme here of grace to the Gentiles, and uh, though that's an emphasis of Luke, here it shows up in Matthew and Mark in this particular case that uh, doesn't have a parallel in Luke. Place in salvation history, a hint of the gospel to the Gentiles, uh, but uh, some relationship to the Jews is here uh, specified in this particular case. Uh, it fits perhaps the, uh, uh, to the Jews first and also to the Gentiles that uh, uh, Paul brings up a couple of times. Huh? This is the uh, most striking recorded exorcism, as we noted above, uh, being remote and uh, such, and uh, being for a, a Gentile uh, woman and her child and such. Symbolic elements. The woman's parable regarding the dogs, huh? Uh, so uh, uh, <clears throat> the dogs get to eat the crumbs under the table, so the Gentiles should get to eat the crumbs from Jesus' miraculous ministry. Prediction of the gospel of the Gentiles, I think we see here, uh, by what we might call synecdoche, apart from the whole. This woman uh, gets uh, uh, Jesus' compassion and uh, deliverance for a daughter, and so that's a sample of what uh, 
will be a, a very major thing uh, after Jesus returns to heaven. <clears throat> uh, a third demonic uh, uh, situation is where Jesus uh, delivers the possessed boy in Matthew 17, Mark 9, and Luke 9. Here it looks like in Mark, <clears throat> when they came to the other disciples, they had just come back from the, uh, the uh, uh, yeah, transfiguration. And it's about a day later. Uh, so Jesus and the uh, three that were with him, they saw a large crowd around the other disciples and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder, ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about, he asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. O oh, unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the, asked the boy's father, How long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for him who believes. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the evil spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive him out? He replied, this kind can only come out by prayer, some manuscripts add, and fasting. Historicity of the events, well, what's the occasion? The uh, <clears throat> event is linked with the transfiguration in all three Gospels. The disciples left behind could not heal the boy. The scribes are apparently hassling them for this. Liberal explanation, the boy is merely an epileptic. epileptic. Uh, some of the characteristics, in fact, are epileptic, though you might very well say uh, that uh, demonic possession is able to bring upon certain types of symptoms uh, that a person may or may not have already been uh, uh, susceptible to. <clears throat> Evidence historicity, three accounts, all with some different details. Father's faith is a striking detail, Mark 9, 24, I do believe help me overcome my unbelief. Huh? Reaction the eyewitnesses. Only Luke records their astonishment. <clears throat> Similar miracles. Noted above, little in the Old Testament demonic possession. Saul's troubles closest, 1 Samuel 16. Spirit interference with human action is also seen in the Spirit of God stopping Paul, stopping Saul, uh, 1 Samuel 19. Uh, immediate effect. Demon gets in its last shot, uh, Mark 9, 26. The boy is healed, possibly even resurrected. <clears throat> Everybody is amazed. The disciples are puzzled about their inability. Place in salvation history, even demonic forces are subject to Jesus. Is the situation tougher for the disciples? I think uh, implication of Jesus' remarks is they don't really believe. That's got us into a long discussion over 2,000 years of church history on how much faith you need and that sort of thing. And Jesus already made some comments about that. If you've got a little bit of faith as much as a mustard seed, etc., uh, it's, uh, uh, you can accomplish great things. Not because faith is some power that you can do something, as you hear in a lot of the uh, uh, very strongly Pentecostal type uh, things here today, but it's who you've got faith in. Okay, If you're really trusting God, then God will do some spectacular things through you. He's not turning over the running of the universe to you, so uh, you should not expect that uh, 
uh, every prayer you have, every attempt to heal anybody is going to work necessarily, uh, but uh, uh, he will do some spectacular things. And so we really need to trust him. And uh, that, I think, is what we have here. Uh, the faithless generation uh, suggests uh, uh, probably, uh, well, there's some complication here on how to translate generation. Uh, in English, generation normally means this time period, and it might mean that here because that, that's part of the meaning of the word. It could also mean faithless race. The Israelites have become a, uh, uh, rather unbelieving at this point, or it might even be uh, the descendants of Adam, uh, that uh, just human uh, sin, if you like, and the unbelief and such associated with this. So that, that passage would be a little tricky to be quite sure what Jesus is saying. Uh, it mentions prayer and possibly mentions fasting. So prayer, trusting in Jesus, and uh, trusting in Christ, uh, trusting in the Father. Uh, we aren't given a narrative of what the disciples had been doing. So uh, uh, were they just trying to do a name it and claim it sort of thing, and it wasn't working, and they didn't pray as they should have? Don't know. Uh, the end fasting does not show up in all the manuscripts, and so we're not sure how hard to push on this, but obviously God does do some things in response to the fasting of people, which means they're taking something very seriously, so uh, that it's possible that that uh, would be included here as well. Symbolic elements. Is there an eschatological reference here to this particular situation? Uh, the idea that uh, uh, <coughs> God is going to uh, destroy the activity of the demonic, which he certainly will do at the end of the age. Well, that's our discussion of uh, these miracles over the spirit realm, and want to close our whole discussion here with a little bit about the significance of Jesus' miracles. Old Testament background. Jesus' miracles are as impressive as any of the Old Testament miracles. Only those of Moses, Elijah, and Elisha come close. Jesus' method of working miracles generally seems to be more direct than those of Moses, Elijah, and Elisha. Uh, Moses has got the staff, he's got the hand, etc. Jesus typically, uh, in several cases, uh, does something miraculous without even saying anything. Uh, think, for instance, of uh, 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 <coughs> the uh, uh, royal official who he sends home uh, to his son and says to him, you'll live, but he doesn't say, Lord, please, please cause the guy to live or something like that. Uh, so uh, you've got that Elijah and Elisha lay down on these dead bodies and breathe into them, etc. And Jesus uh, uh, touches the, uh, the uh, widow of Nain's son. Uh, not clear that he even touches uh, Lazarus or uh, Jairus' daughter. Uh, it does speak to them, etc. So in general, uh, Jesus' methods of working miracles seem more direct than those of Moses, Elijah, Elisha. Elijah goes up onto the mountain and uh, uh, prays to God for the rain and sends off his servant and comes back and goes out again and comes back, etc. And Jesus says, shut up, be quiet, and the wind and the waves stop. So uh, uh, pretty impressive in that direction, I think. Uh, we often see a connection with creation in uh, uh, connection with, uh, the G uh, with the miracles of Jesus, looking back at creation. So uh, uh, we apparently have creation in connection with turning the water into wine, not changing the amount of stuff, but certainly changing the character of the stuff. Uh, C.S. Lewis points out in his book, Miracles, that uh, what Jesus does in turning the water into wine is what God does every year, but God does it providentially through a slow process that takes uh, the whole season, if you like, and Jesus does it in, who knows, a few seconds, a couple minutes, something of that sort. Uh, we weren't there to see it happen. Multiplying the loaves and fish, same sort of thing uh, there. Uh, definitely an increase in the quantity of the material, uh, though not there changing there, uh, changing its nature, if you like. <clears throat> Apparent recreation. Uh, healing the blind man with the use of clay, I suggested perhaps a recreation of his eyesight. Uh, we don't know exactly what was wrong with his blind, uh, you know, what uh, form his blindness took. Huh? <clears throat> Compare Genesis 2-7, the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. And the word there, King Je uh, the NIV, formed, okay, is this yatsar uh, that uh, uh, cognate uh, noun is uh, potter, okay, so molded, we might say, would be uh, closer to it. 
resurrections, apparent recreations in some sense too. Huh? Connection with redemption or eschatology is a characteristic feature of Jesus' miracles. Healing the blind, the lame, the deaf, as sketched in various eschatological passages. Pick one here, Isaiah 35, 4. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear, your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution, he will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. Resurrection is a main feature of the end times. Daniel 12.1, at that time Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. There will be a time of distress such as has not, been ha has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So resurrection, a main feature of the end times. Connection uh, with creation and redemption. It's been noticed uh, that mir Jesus' miracles are real and striking, yet they are provisional. He only heals some people, not everyone. A couple of references there, a uh, most explicit. Uh, he could not heal uh, many in Nazareth because of their lack of faith. And then by implication, the healing at the Pool of Bethesda, where we're told a place crowded with people, and yet only this one guy is healed, okay? He only raises some of the dead, not all. And uh, I've heard several pastors uh, in preaching say, he says, Lazarus come forth, lest when he said it, if he made it too general, everybody would come forth. I guess, but there's some biblical warrant, at least for the idea that he only raised some of the dead, not all, that's good. <clears throat> this is not an indication of Jesus' limitations, but an indication of God's schedule. Uh, this is the already, it's not the, not yet, okay. Jesus' miracles are a foretaste of what is to come, and when he returns, <clears throat> uh, excuse me, a foretaste of what is to come when he returns. Just as the Lord's Supper is only a foretaste of the Messianic banquet. Jesus claims, Jesus claims to be able to forgive sins, and he supports this by a visible miracle. He shows himself to be the master over wind and weather, disease and death, fish and animals, and even over the supernatural spirit beings. Though not a feature of these talks, he shows himself to know what is going to happen in the future. Well, that's our tour of the miraculous and the miracles of Jesus. There were certainly more that could be said about the miraculous. I didn't do anything with the whole charismatic controversy of the 20th century, uh, but stuck to uh, what we might call medieval uh, up to a medieval period, something of that sort. And certainly there was more that could be said about Jesus' miracles. We only looked at uh, a selection of them, and actually uh, a part of that selection was done by doing ones that I hadn't already done PowerPoints on. But I hope it gives you a feel for uh, the importance of the miraculous in Christianity and the weakness of the arguments against the miraculous uh, that we typically see in secular circles. Thank you very much, and uh, may the Lord bless you as you seek to know him. This is Dr. Robert C. Newman in his short course on the Miraculous and the Miracles of Jesus, Lecture 7, Miracles of Jesus over the Spiritual Realm.